Ja. Då tänkte jag hälsa er välkomna till den här docentföreläsningen av Christiane Schmitt. Och som många av er vet så är det här det slutliga provet man avlägger när man vill bli docent. Det har innan det här funnits en sakkunnig granskning som var mycket gynnsam. Så att det är bara själva föreläsningen som återstår. Och eftersom det är en docentföreläsning så kommer den att bedömas av en docentnämnd som består av Jana Björn, Mikael Hörnqvist och jag själv. Och med Jan Lundgren som adjungerad person. Jag heter alltså Torke Glad och är ordförande i docentnämnden. Och direkt efter föreläsningen så kommer docentnämnden att lämna det här Zoom-mötet och eh, ha ett sammanträde där vi diskuterar föreläsningen och sen kommer vi att återkomma till Zoom-mötet och meddela resultatet. Och med det så är jag ordet till dig Christian. Uh, tack så mycket för det. Uh, jag ska byta till engelska för föreläsningen. Um, en anmärkning i början. Bara, um, några kollegor har frågat mig om vi kan inspela föreläsning så det blir inspelat av Anders bara för information. Okej, okay. I'll switch to English and I hope you can see what I'm showing you. Um, let me know if there are any problems with what you're seeing. Okej, okay. så so I'll talk about geometric problems in theory and applications. So what is going to be the agenda for today? First, I'll tell you a bit about my toolbox and what does all of that mean. So what are algorithms? What is computation geometry? These kind of things. Um, then I'll tell you a bit about the applications that I'm working in. And then I'll focus on two problem, problem areas. One, the Edgar problem and its variants. And more from an application perspective, aircraft arrival routes and airspace sectorization. And then I'll finish with some outlook. Okay, so just before we get started, um, on my way here, as you can see, I alternated between applied math and theoretical computer science uh, departments that kind of give the hint that I'm doing research and algorithms and the switch to um, KDS kind of tells you that I'll have uh, applications in this case uh, in transportation systems. And of course, all the work that I'm presenting here or even just mentioning is joint work with many courses. So I'd like to thank all of them and other people I'm working with before I'll actually start with the content. Okay, so what does all of that mean? Um, when I have a new problem and I'm thinking about what I should do about that, there are kind of a few buzzwords that I have in my head. That's computational complexity, algorithms, optimization, and of course the question is what does all of that mean? So what's the problem? Well, one problem is you're given ingredients, you're given butter, sugar, eggs, and so on, and you need to figure out how to make a chocolate cake. A problem somewhat closer to those that I'm interested in is you're given a graph, you have unit edge lengths, and you have a special vortex S, and now you want to find the shortest path from that special vertex S to the other vertices. And one such graph would be the, that on the right hand side. And to get even closer to those problems that I'm actually interested in, um, we could be given a ground plan of an art gallery that for me defines a polygon. And then we want to know how many guards do we need to position in the art gallery so that every point of it is seen. And because that's a problem that we'll consider a lot, let's look at it into detail. So we want to know how many guards we need to monitor such a polygon. So what's a guard? Well, for us, a guard is a person, but mathematically speaking, it's just a point. So the head of that guard that I drew there. And it has a slightly different visibility properties than we have. The guard has 360 degree vision, so it can see to all sides and also can see arbitrarily far. But other properties of this visibility are exactly like we think about it. Well, we can see another point if the straight line connection is not interrupted by walls or any other obstacles. And that's what this guard sees as well. So the guard that I placed here sees all the points that are marked in red, and that's what we call the visibility polygon of the guard. And what you can see here are that there are still black areas of that polygon. So this guard cannot see everything, but we could place another guard and now the two together actually completely monitor the art gallery, the polygon. So 
this is the art gear problem. We want to know how many we use. Here we use two, and we could actually so show that two are optimal in that case. So if we look what I have on the left-hand side, that gives us the general problem. We have a general description of parameters. We know that we have butter and sugar and X, and we have a graph. We have a polygon. And we give the statements of the properties of the results. So we want to have a chocolate cake, or we want to have the shortest pass from S to the other vertices. We want to know how many guards we need. And then what I showed on the right-hand side are instances where we actually define the values. So we have four X and not just X. We have this special graph with seven vertices or this specific polygon with 12 vertices and their locations. And then if we go back to the left-hand side, there's something slightly different for about the second and the third problem. Well, A, they are more mathematical, but also we're asking about the shortest path and the minimum number of guards that we need. So here we're trying to find an optimum version of something. So those are optimization problems. And that's what we'll look at mostly today. So we know what a problem is. Now we have to ask ourselves, what's an algorithms? algorithm? And it's like a recipe. So you start with your ingredients and then you have steps. You heat the oven, you beat butter, sugar, and vanilla into fluffy and so on. You finally bake it. And then you have an output, which is the chocolate cake that you wanted to have. And the idea of this recipe is that if you start with the same ingredients, well, not exactly the same, you just put this egg in the first uh, chocolate cake, but the same type of ingredients, and you have the same steps, then you end up with the same results, a similar chocolate cake that you had before. And that's what an algorithm will also do. So an algorithm is a list of rules to follow in order to solve a problem. The recipe will solve the problem of baking a chocolate cake. So the solution of a problem really answers the question that we formulated in the problem. And for the art gallery problem on that specific polygon, I would say, well, two guards can see every point and we can give their locations. So that's what we want to get from an algorithm, this answer to the question that we formulated. Um, so let's get back to one of the problems that I mentioned where we wanted to find the shortest path from S to all the other vertices. We have a unit edge length, so we ask for the pairs with a minimum number of edges. And that solves a very classical algorithm that's called breadth first search. So what does that mean? Where well, we start searching at our vertex S and we search into the breadths. So we first look at all of the, uh, the neighbors of S and only when we've done that, we discard S and we start looking further from one of the neighbors. So we start with S and this First, looking at all the neighbors means that we take care of our vertices first in, first out. So first, completely treat S, and only when we're done with that, we go to the next one. So we look at the neighbor, and we build up a tree. One neighbor, S has still another neighbor, so we build that up. Now, S doesn't have any neighbors anymore. We discard it, and we start with the next vertex that we took up. And then we continue and we'll build up such a tree. And building up the tree is the algorithm. And the output tells us, for example, that the shortest path to the rightmost vertex has three edges. OK, so we know what an algorithm should be. It should give us an answer. So then the question is, what is computational complexity? So the, what we ask ourselves is, when is an algorithm that we define design efficient? And that the question then is, how do we measure this efficiency? And we measure it in the time that it takes to produce a solution, which we we'll call the runtime of our algorithm. And that depends on the problem's input size. So if you want to compute the shortest path to all the vertices in a graph with seven vertices, then that's faster than if you want to compute it in a graph with one million vertices. And all our problems have an input size. So for example, the shortest path problem, we have the number of vertices and the number of edges. And for the art gallery problem, we have the number of polygon vertices. So when do we now consider our runtime to be an efficient uh, algorithm runtime? When the runtime is polynomial in the input size. So for example, n squared or n to the 25. Why? The idea is that if your input grows, if you have a larger n, then you do not exponentially grow your runtime. So you don't end up with something that very fast will be a runtime of some years. So we don't want to have something like two to the n as a runtime. We want to have n to some constant. And when we look at the breadth first search that 
uh, I just talked about, then the runtime is order n plus n. And in this big O, we just hide constants. So it, this means that this has a runtime that's linear in the input, and that's clearly a polynomial. And all of the problems that are solvable in polynomial time, we call them P. So that's a class. Unfortunately, there exist problems for which no efficient solution is known. There exist actually way more complexity classes, but we'll forget about them today. So those that for which no efficient solution isn't known. Well, what else exists? There exists a class NP. So if someone gives me a solution, there is some oracle or there is someone drops a solution from heaven, then I can check in polynomial time whether it is in fact a solution. So you could tell me, hey, the shortest path to the rightmost vertex there in this graph, that is length three. And then I can check whether that's in fact true. And that leads to the P versus NP problem, which asks if I can check a solution for correctness in polynomial time, so is it in fact a solution, can I then also find a solution in polynomial time? And what's widely believed is that P does not equal NP, so that generating solutions can be harder than checking them. And from that, we have a definition that we call a problem NP hard if if this problem being in P, so if this problem having an efficient algorithm would imply P equals NP. So what does that mean? Well, if we now have shown that the problem is NP hard and we would find a polynomial time algorithm, an efficient algorithm, then that would show P equals NP, which we do not believe. So we have to take care of these kind of problems differently. And what we do is we, for example, approximate a solution. So instead of saying, hey, this is the optimum, we cannot do that for each instance in that case. So we say, well, this is a solution that is at most a constant factor off from the optimum. So you can guarantee something. Or you use efficient algorithms for optimal solution for many instances. So again, we cannot solve all the instances to optimality, but we show that those that we often encounter, we can actually solve them to optimality. Or we use heuristics, which you don't really prove anything about, so I'm not that interested in this part generally. Out of the problems that we talked about, the art gated problem is such a problem. So it's an NPR problem. We will not, for the general problem, have a polynomial time algorithm. OK, what else was a buzzword there? It was optimization. And of course, what I mean is mathematical optimization. So we want to minimize an objective function over some set of solutions. The objective function tells us how we evaluate how good the solution is. And then we want to minimize or maximize that where our solution comes from a set of feasible solutions. And what I'm usually interested in is a very specific type of these optimization problems where we can formulate both the objective function and the set of feasible solutions linearly, which is linear programming. So that means we can express that problem that we had before using vectors and matrices. And there's one more node. So if some or all the variables that we use have to be discrete, then what we have is integer programming or mixed integer programming. And there is a complexity difference. Linear programming is theoretically polynomial solvable by something that's called the ellipsoid method, where integer program programming is hard. So there we have a discrepancy there. OK, so now we talked about all these terms. So let's say how that comes together. So when I talk about algorithms, for me, that usually means using the problem structure. And often that means using the geometry of the problem to good, get a good solution. So if I have a theoretical work, then it's usually these two things that I'm really interested in. And for the algorithms, it's the design and analysis of algorithms. The implementation is usually what my courses do. And just this area in the lower left part there, that's call it computational geometry. Um, sometimes I only care about the computational complexity. Um, again, there are many more classes. And sometimes I'll try to use all of that together, which then often means to use the geometry in optimization. And we'll see an example of that. When we talk about applications, it's usually more focused on finding a solution, not so, there, not so much um, settling the complexity. So let's figure out which applications I mean here. Uh, as I already mentioned, application in transportation. And uh, one large one is in air traffic management, where we, for example, 
uh, computed the optimal standard arrival routes for aircraft with a limited turning angle. So what does limited turning angle mean? Well, you cannot fly with an aircraft like that. That's just physically not possible. So you have a limit there. And you want to have the routes, how the aircraft should arrive in the area around the airport. Um, we also devised an optimal division of the airspace around an airport into sectors, where each sector is controlled by one air traffic controller and makes sure that uh, the traffic there is safely uh, guarded. What we've done recently is to also look at uh, arrival routes, but now to guarantee separation, temporal separation of the aircraft. So if they arrive at the time that they fired for, and they follow the routes, then they will automatically be separated temporarily. So the controllers only have to check that that in fact happened and not provide the separation. Where all our aircraft follow continuous descent operation profiles. So what does that mean? Well, often if you fly, then you have, you go down and then you have a flight level of, and you go down and you have a level of flight. When you have con continuous descent operation, that means that you fly, um, with idle thrust and no speed brakes. So you really just descend continuously and that uses, um, burns less fuel and you have fewer emissions and fewer noise. So that's something that you actually want to achieve. Um, and also something completely ungeometric. Uh, we, for example, do optimal air traffic controller shifts planning. Other areas are railway traffic where we, for example, want to insert an additional freight train into the timetable close to operation. So for example, it can depart early. How do we allow it to do that? And also to estimate the capacity for that additional train pass. So how many can we insert in a certain time window? And there are also applications in car sharing and quite newly also in nautical planning. Of course, all of those <laughs> application-oriented research that's done with partners and funding agencies, where on the top you'll see quite a few of those. If we have an application, so how, how do we start there? Well, first we discuss the problem in detail with the operational experts to then be able to reflect the operational constraints of the problem as well as possible. And that might often mean that we actually have to make assumptions to come up with a simplified problem that we then solve that still benefits uh, the uh, problem holder. And it also can mean that we have different objectives. So what we can do in that case is to highlight the traders for the operational experts or to present Pareto optimal solutions so that they can pick what they think is more important. Okay. <clears throat> and with that, I'm going to move to the first of the problems that I plan to talk about, the art gallery problem and its variants. So when I say and its variants, what do I mean there? Well, we can alter many things. We can alter the capabilities of the guards and the environment to be guarded. I'm going to focus on presenting those that are actually worked on. There are many, many more variants that you can think about. So let's look at what we can, how we can alter the capabilities of the guards. Uh, we can look at K-transmitter, which are motivated for modems, where, as you know, if you want to connect a receiver with a modem, that's still possible if there's a wall or maybe two wall in bet between you and the modem, but at some point that won't be possible. So here, if we say that we have a two transmitter, then it's okay that this straight line connection crosses at most two walls. So in this case, if this guard would be a two transmitter, he would monitor the complete problem. You could also think about fading. So usually if you have light, then that fades over distance. And that's also the case for laser uh, light. So what we want to do is we want to place lights and assign an energy of brightness. And here you can see to the right of the polygon, it's now too dark. If we had a normal guard, this left light bulb would completely see that. And so what we want to make sure of it now is that everything is sufficiently lit where we just normalize to one. And then instead of minimizing the number of guards, we want to minimize the total energy that we need to monitor or to completely lit our um, polygon. We could also think about something that's called a chromatic art gallery problem. So as I said before, we want to find the minimum number of guards that see everything. So in this example, that would be n over four guards placed here. For the chromatic art gallery problem, we want to find a colored guard cover. So no point in the polygon, should be seen by two guards that have the same color. 
Now, if you, <coughs> sorry, if you look at that polygon, all the points in the kernel there in the center, they are seen by all the guards. So we have to color each of these guards differently. And that would mean we need n over four colors. Well, we can do better. So let's place a guard at each spike with alternating colors. Then you see that the visibility polygons of two of those blue, blue guards do not overlap. So they are fine coloring. So we only have to take care of the center there. We'll place another guard and we use only three colors. So that's not the minimum number of guards. We use n over two plus one instead of n over four, but we don't care about the number of guards. In the chromatic arc gather point, we only care about the number of colors that we assign to guards. How can we rewrite the environment? Well, there are, again, lots and lots of possibilities. A very traditional thing is to look at simple polygons or polygons with holes, where a simple polygon is one that does not intersect itself and has no holes. And on the right hand side there, the pink structures, those are holes. So those are often classes that are considered. We could restrict our polygon classes. We could say we only look at rectilinear polygons. And we can also abstract from looking at polygons at all and say, hey, we guard terrains, 1.5D terrains, which are just X monotone chains. And then we could again, but look at the capabilities of the guards. The guards could be located on the terrain. So like you're a person that's moving along mountains or you're building masts there. While you could also say, hey, maybe we have a drone flying and they can fly up to a certain height. And now we want to guard everything from those. What are the kind of results that we then usually get when we have an art gallery problem? So the very traditional first results were so-called art gallery theorems, where we say X guards are always sufficient and sometimes necessary to guard a polygon with N vertices. So what does it mean? Sometimes necessary means there is a polygon from that class for which we need X guards. We can't guard it with X minus one guards. And always sufficient means for any polygon of that class, we have a strategy of actually placing X guards that we can show will monitor the complete polygon. And the first result in art galleries was um, by Schwartal that in a simple polygon with N vertices, N over three rounded down many guards are sometimes necessary and always sufficient. And this kind of results we, for example, uh, presented for the K transmitters. Then, as we already talked about, computation of complexity. So the upgrade problem was shown to be NP hard for point cards. Point cards means, as you can see on the left hand side, that you can place your guards wherever you want. Inside the polygon, on the boundary, you're completely free. And for vertex guards without holes, vertex guards means you have to restrict your guards to be located on the vertices of the polygon. And then finally, also for point guards without holes. And that we, for example, showed for K transmitters and also for the chromatic art gallery problem, um, the hardness. And then, of course, we're interested in algorithms. And that depends on the complexity. So if we have an NPR problem, as we said, then we need to take care of it by approximation algorithms or efficient algorithms. If we don't have an NPR problem, then we want to have an efficient algorithm. So that should be poly time. And often what we do is we use structural results that help us to show these three points. Okay, so we'll start with efficient algorithms for optimal solutions for many instances. And that's an LP based procedure for the art gallery problem. So the main idea is to formulate the art gallery problem as an IP. And that's a very traditional covering problem. So any point in the polygon could be a guard. In that case, the variable XG is one. And you want to make sure that each point of the polygon, it's a witness now. So it's witnessing that this point is seen in the visibility polygon of each point, there needs to be a, at least one guard. And then you want to minimize the total number of guards. There are a few problems with that. Um, we cannot solve infinite IPs. So what we do is we solve the IP relaxation. So we allow fractional guard values between zero and one. And that means instead of having a person, we can think about light, which you can turn on and off, or you can dim it to fractional values. And for us, that will give us a lower bound. The other problem is that we cannot solve infinite LPs. We currently have um, a variable for every point in the polygon, and we have a constraint for every point in the polygon. So what we do is we restrict to finite sets, and we use column generation. So we have a finite set of guard candidates and a finite set of witness point points that need to be monitored. So how does that work? We start with some discrete set of guard candidates and some set of witnesses. And then we solve our 
LP relaxation. So for example, this. Um, voice witnesses in blue get a total value of one, 0 0.5 on each of these two. But what do we have to do then? Well, we need to ask ourselves, is actually the entire polygon covered because we didn't write down all our constraints. So that means we have to solve the primal separation problem. Either say, yes, our solution is feasible even for the entire polygon, or we need to say, hey, here's a violated constraint and present a half plane that separates our solution from the feasible solutions. And that means we have to answer the question, is there a point in the polygon that's not in our set W yet that is not seen by enough, that is seen by a total number of guides less than one. And to answer that, we go actually to the geometry. So geometric problems. What we do is we build the overlay of the visibility polygons and they are constant on each vertex, each edge and each face. So we can simply iterate over all the facets and see, are there some for which this constraint is violated? And we can, for example, say, yes, for this point it's violated, it's zero, and that's definitely less than one. And so with that, we generate witnesses by using uh, the separation. And what we do then is we go to the dual problem. So we have the primal, it's a minimum coverage problem. So the dual is a maximum packing problem. If it would be the IP, it means we pack witnesses. We try to place points such that none of those together see the same point so that the visibility polygons are pairwise disjoint. Here, again, we place fractional values and we want to make sure that nowhere we stack up visibility polygons that are more than one. And then we want to maximize those that we can place. So again, we solve that. And then we have to ask ourselves, is the entire polygon pack feasible? So we know that it's feasibly at those points G, the red points. That means solving the dual separation problem. So we ask ourselves, is there a point that's in the polygon, but not in our set G, for which we stack the visibility polygons to high, for which it's larger than one? And to solve that, again, we go to the geometry. We build the overlay of the visibility polygons of those um, witnesses. And then we can say, hey, there's a part where that's 1.3. So we should place another guard here to make sure that that is integrated the next time. So we found a violated constraint and we generate guards. And what we can show is that if we, so we pick initial G and W and then we repeat solving the IP relaxation, solving the primal on dual separation, updating lower bounds, upper bounds, integer solutions, doing that until the gap is zero. Then if that terminates, then it does so with an optimal result. And there are, of course, parts where we have can steer what are the initial G and W. Do we alternate primal dual, primal dual, or do we do that differently? But we will end there. So let's look at an example. This is a primal problem. Gray is one. So gray, blue, and turquoise is good. Greenish and yellow is not. So we still are not feasible here. This is a dual where we want to pack. So again, gray is one. Yellow and greenish is fine. Blue and turquoise is not. So we iterate. We set the primal, the dual, the primal, the dual, primal, dual, primal, dual, and primal, dual. And now we have 10 guards and 10 witnesses. So we found matching bounds. So our solution is optimal. And what we did is we had a random orthogonal, a random simple, a random von Koch polygons and spikes, which were constructed so that they enforce point guards and otherwise vertex guards, we need more. And those are optimality rates for uh, runs that are aborted after 20 minutes. And what you can see is we don't solve always, but we can always find bounds. And let's go back to what I showed. I said, if it terminates, then there's an optimal result. So what does that mean? Well, we have to have this if it terminates. Otherwise, we have an NP-hard problem. Now we would have a polynomial time solution for that. That can't be the case. And why do we have problems? In this polygon, only those three guards can guard with three. If you wiggle any of those, you need more guards. And the one in the center is not on the extension of any edges or anything like that. And if you look at our algorithm, then you see point clouds, point clouds of guard candidates that are kind of close, but we don't hit them. We have a two-dimensional facets, and we always place guards. We could place one or 100 whenever we have a violated constraint. But to be able to solve that, we would have to guess the exact one-dimensional 
or zero dimensional point in this two dimensional facet, and we cannot guess it correctly. Um, what more? Well, in fact, we wanted integer solutions, right? So what we also did is we used IP solvers, we proposed a difference of convex function algorithms, and we actually used cutting planes. So we enumerated all the Abgari facets with coefficients in 0, 1, 2, which allowed us to solve larger instances. OK, let's move to another guarding problem. We look at the 1.5D terrain guarding problem. Here, we'll focus on those green parts. Um, and in particular, we'll start with structural results. Just as a reminder, um, to point see each other if the line in this case is nowhere below the terrain, so these cannot see each other. And again, we have a visibility region, which in this case can have many uh, connected components. And our problem is we're given a set of guard candidates and a set of witnesses, red and blue, and we want to find a minimum guard cardinality guard cover G prime, a subset of the reds that covers all the blue. So let's say we pick the green ones and we build the visibility regions from left to right. And then what you can see is that all the blue witnesses are seen by a guard in that set. So it's a solution. And that's a terrain guarding problem on discrete sets G and W. And the version that we're actually interested in is a continuous terrain guarding problem where we want to see the entire terrain and guards can be placed anywhere on the terrain. And the vertex guard version where we still want to monitor the entire terrain, but the guards are restricted to be located on vertices. And what we showed is that for each finite guard set G, there exists a finite witness set W of G, such that a solution for the discrete version with sets G and W of G is feasible for the version where we use G to monitor the entire terrain. And we showed that for each terrain, there's a finite guard can be set U, such that for each possible optimal guard cover for the continuous version, so that sees everything, uh, we have a subset of this finite guard candidate set that has the same cardinality. And together we could show that if we have a feasible optimal solution for the terrain guarding problem with discrete guard candidate set that you and induced witness set W of you, then this is optimal and feasible for the continuous version. And that's a discretization that's actually not possible to get for the Abgarit problem. So I'm not going to show you how we did that. I just tell you what follows from that. Um, it was, there exists a lot of approximation algorithm and NP hardness was shown but NP completeness wasn't known. And with our construction, we could also establish membership in NP and then show another complexity, which is called NP completeness. Um, also, uh, Gibson et al. have presented a polynomial time approximation scheme for the discrete terrain guarding version, where you have finite guards and witness sets. PTAS means you give me an epsilon, I give you a one plus epsilon approximation. So I can't get exactly to the optimum, but I can get arbitrarily close to that. And because we have our discretization now, we can show that there exists such a p-test as well for the continuous version. So for any constants, epsilon that are larger than zero, there's a polynomial time algorithm that outputs a guard set um, that monitors the complete terrain and which cardinality is at most one finds epsilon that of the optimal guard set. And we also, again, used IP to given efficient algorithms. This time we have our discrete guarding ca uh, candidates and witnesses, so we don't have to do um, column generation. We have order n squared guards, order n cubed witnesses, which is great from a theoretical point of view. It's not good for an implementation. So what we actually did is we had to devise several filtering techniques to filter out most of the point guard candidates. So if you look there from the left to the right, we filtered out about 90% 90, 90 of the point guard candidates. And what that meant is um, that when we solve, so we solve vertex versions and point guard versions, that you don't see the difference that much anymore. So point guards is hard, vertex is not, but you still um, can nearly solve the same set of polygons. Okay, let's get a bit more practical. We're moving toward ATM. Altitude terrain guarding and guarding unimonotone polygons. So what does that mean? Well, let's assume you have a terrain and you have drones flying on top of that and you want to see every point. And now your drones can fly arbitrarily high. So we have an altitude cap. And while well, that's 2.5D, well, we'll start with 1.5D again. So we have the terrain and we have an altitude line above that, which is the highest to which we can fly. 
And again, two points see each other if the line correction is nowhere below the terrain, so these two cannot see each other, and each point has a visibility region. And now we want to have the fewest number of guards on that altitude line that see the complete terrain. What's a unimonotron polygon? Well, the, the monotron polygon is one where the intersection with any vertical line is one connected component. And so what we do is we take the extremal point and cut away the upper chain, the upper polygon chain, and if that's possible, substitute it with a horizontal line. That's a unimonotron polygon. And again, we have visibility polygons in there. Um, and what we showed is that the altitude terrain guiding problem and the art guide problem for unimonotron polygons are equivalent. So we can only take care of one of them and we're good. Okay, lots of problems that I talked about now. Let's try to put them into context. We have the terrain guiding premise where the guides have to be on the terrain. We have the art gallery problem. And both of them are NP hard. The art gallery problem, even in monotone polygons. So our two problems kind of feel to be in between, which would you would assume that they're probably also NP hard, but actually not. For both of them, we can find a polynomial time algorithm. So we show a polytime algorithm for um, the um, Altitude terrain guarding problem, and we show that unimonotone polygons are perfect. What does that mean? So remember, a witness set is a set of uh, points for which the visibility polygons are pairwise disjoint. And it's a maximum witness set if it's a set of maximum cardinality. And now a polygon class is perfect if for each polygon in that class, the cardinality of a minimum guard set and the cardinality of a maximum witness set are the same. And we just showed that we can solve everything with a simple sweep algorithm. So we have event points whenever we, by moving more to the right, would lose complete coverage. We would no longer see all points of an edge. We start with no guards placed. We go from left to right, place a guard whenever we would lose coverage of an edge. Then we compute the visibility polygon, discard all the edges that we have seen, and we update event points. So for example, for this uh, edge E prime, that's partly seen, so we have a new point the yellow at which we will lose coverage for that edge. We place another guard, update visibility polygons, and we'll end up with those four guards. And what we can show is that the output is feasible and that it is optimal. And optimality we show by finding a set of witnesses that has the same cardinality. Again, we have dual problems, so we show optimality. We built strips that are epsilon smaller than the widths between two guards. And then we can show that we can place witnesses so that the witness visibility polygon is fully contained in those strips that do not overlap so they are pairwise disjoint and we found a witness set. And that also means we show that unimonotone polygons are perfect. Okay, so here we show polytime algorithms and other structural results. And with that, let's go to an actual application. So if you look at the area surrounding airports, where your team A, then there's lots of congestion. Why? Everything has to go together there. You have traffic en route can spread out, but you have to come to the airport. So you want to design the arrival routes, the departure routes, and the sectorization, so the division of airspace into sectors that are monitored by controllers, so that you allow a high throughput on the runway, many movements. Um, you have the controllers there, so they bring a human in the loop. They need to monitor the planes constantly, and they always need to provide safe separation between aircraft. So what we should make sure is that we don't have high complexity anywhere. You shouldn't have points where lots of possible routes cross where a controller has to look all the time. And you also want to have that the cast load of controllers should be balanced. So not one is working way more than others. And you have geometric constraint, for example, convexity, and um, that's easy to grasp. So you actually know where your con sector ends. And if you have a straight line flight, that it does not enter and leave a sector multiple times. Each time leaving and entering, you have a handover operation. You don't want to have that too many times. So that's a desired property. So this arrival road T problem is you're given the location of the enterprise to the TMA, you're given the location and direction of the airport runway, and you want to find a, a arrival tree that merges all your traffic to the runway, and you have certain constraints. So you don't want to have too many routes merging at a point. Again, you don't want to have high complexity for the controllers. In theory, that could still mean you can play with them arbitrarily close to each other, which for the controller still means the same thing, lots of traffic merging in a small area. So you have to separate 
the merge point. Um, you can't make sharp turns. So again, this is impossible. We have an angle threshold and a minimum edge length because otherwise you could just put lots of large angles together and still get um, that sharp turn. We want to avoid certain obstacles, um, no fly zones, and we want to separate stars, the arrival routes, and sit the um, departure routes. We want to have them crossing far away from the runway because at that point in time they have different flight heights, so they are already separated vertically and we don't have to take care of them that much. And that are, for example, the routes that we get from there because I'm not going to focus that much on the arrival routes, I'm going to focus more on the sectorization. So what does that mean? For me, again, the sectorization problem comes with the polygon. So the coordinates of the TMA define the polygon. We're given a number of sectors, as many controllers that we have, and we have a set of constraints on those sectors. And then we want to partition the polygon into k disjoint polygons that fulfill our constraints. And they could be that we want to have a balanced task node between the controllers. The sector should be connected, should have a nice shape, so not zigzagging, and no one knows if there's aircraft in my or the neighboring sector. We want to have convex sectors, again, for the straight line flights. And if there happen to be conflict points, so where there is increased tension necessary, then those should be inside the sectors and not at the boundary, because then other controllers would be part of that. And actually, most formulations of the airspace sectorization problems are in the hard. So what we are aiming for are efficient algorithms again. Um, I talked about task load, balanced task load. So that's a complete <laughs> own research area. And we've looked into that as well. For us here, it's heat maps of the density of weighted clicks of air traffic controller on a radar map. So that's like here, we did something. Um, and so that's our task loss measure. And we don't depend on those specific maps. We're just using those heat maps. Okay, so what we do is we overlay the TMA with a square grid. We have a graph where each vertex is connected to its eight neighbors. And the basic idea for the sectorization is that we encompass the complete boundary by an artificial sector that uses all counterclockwise edges. And then we say whenever we use an edge, we also have to use the other edge for another sector. And then we can just say, okay, our variables are yijs that tells us if an edge ij is used for a sector s. And then we have all these constraints that make sure that the union of our s sectors completely covers the TMA. So it's really a partition. And now we had those other constraints. So we wanted to have a balanced task load. How do we get there? Well, first, we don't know which edges we'll pick for the sector. So first thing is to assign an area to the sector that we select by boundary edges. And if we have a polygon with rational vertices, we can compute that efficiently by introducing a reference point and then computing the area of the triangle of that reference point, which each directed edge. And then we sum up the triangle area of all the edges. So if we have clockwise triangles, or the red ones, they will contribute positively. We have counterclockwise triangles, they will contribute negatively, and then you have the area of the polygon. So if we say Fij is the signed area of the triangle edge Ij and R, and we can compute those before and for all the possible edges in our grid, then with this first constraint, we assign the area of sector S to AS. We only sign up over all the Fij where we pick this edge Ij for our sector S. And those will be, again, like you see in this upper picture, you will actually assign the total area of the polygon to your sector. And then we just make sure that the sum of those is actually the sum of the total TMA. But we wanted to have a task load. So we overlay the heat map with a grid and extract values at the grid points. So we have a discretized heat map where we have heat values at those points. And then we can just say, well, now we want to figure out how many of those points are in the inside, right? So let's look at the sign of this triangle of the Fij, plus or minus, for a red it's plus. And then we just say, OK, Hij is summing up all the heat points in a triangle and giving it the sign of our uh, area. And then with this constraint, uh, the second there, we just say, this, when we pick Hij to sector S, then it should contribute to the task load of sector S. And then we can just give upper and lower bounds on that task. I said one more thing that we want to have convex sectors. Um, what is true for a convex sector? Well, if you have a convex sector, then from the reference point, you have only one connected chain of edges with clockwise triangles and one with counterclockwise triangles. Unfortunately, the only if part of that statement is not true. So to the right, you also have only one chain of clockwise and one of counterclockwise triangles, but 
because of the reference location, you would still see that as convex. Good thing is we only have eight edge directions. So the only possibility that make our polygon non-convex are those. So we need to place a reference point in the gray areas and we're good. The dark gray are the intersection of those. We can look at those dark gray for all the possible orientations. And those we can identify for the complete graph. So we build a building bo bounding box around our TMA and place four reference points in those colored cones. And then what we know is at least one of these reference points will detect a switch from a counterclockwise to a clockwise uh, chain for non-convex polygons. So we now have pi ijm. We still have the triangle, but now we have the reference point rm. And what we do is we assign for each sector and each vertex a value of minus one, zero, one. It's zero if you're in the interior of a clockwise or counterclockwise chain. And it's minus one or one if you are switching between the chains. And then what you need to make sure is it's convex if the sum of the abstract values of those is two for all reference points, because you only have one switch there. If we formulated that with this, you have a multiplication of variables where you can take care of that by introducing a new one, and then we actually can enforce convexity. And those are the uh, resulting sectorization where and to the left hand side, um, you see that we use an objective function to enforce connected sectors and interior conflict points. And on the right hand side, you see how we actually get convex sectors where the interior, interior conflict points or the darker red points are more in the interior. Okay, with that a very brief outlook, um, what do I plan to continue? Well. Continuous various traffic applications. As I said, we now worked a lot with integrating those continuous to send profiles in our arrival route, doing an analysis of the fuel efficiency and of the, um, uh, with, yeah, how we reduce the pressure on the controllers with doing that. Um, we have now also start or will start a project where we'll do um, train dispatcher shift. Uh, scheduling, we'll do nautical planning, so lots of applications. And I also plan to continue with the more theoretical work for computation geometry problems, which of course incl includes further adgary problems, so there are still lots of open problems, but also other problems where we really use the geometry of the problem um, to get good algorithms. And with that, I'll say thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>